you're looking at some of the remains of what was once one of the largest rail yards in America. At its peak during World War II, this yard handled more than 5,000 railroad cars per day. At the end of the war, the yard's importance began to decline as freight traffic across New England shifted to road transport and heavy industry left the region, a familiar story of the times. But today, most of it sits abandoned in the woods being reclaimed by nature. Light towers, tracks, buildings, and control towers are all hidden here. But one of the craziest parts about this spot today, somewhere in this abandoned labyrinth sits a 14 foot tall polar bear in the remains of one of the repair shops, which is what we went to hunt down as we explored the history here. Welcome to the abandoned Cedar Hill Rail Yard. I was joined on this trip by my friends Dave and Suthi, and we set out on a chilly gray day in April. We were following a tidal marsh trail right on the river, which made for a beautiful setting. Scattered through the woods are remnants of the original yard, and it's a pretty gnarly sight. Not just because of the abandoned history, but because in 2020, a tornado with wind speeds over 100 miles an hour ripped through here. Trees were uprooted, light towers were toppled, and debris was scattered through the trails. You're basically looking at the aftermath of Fight Night, nature versus the bando. I'll let you decide who won that one. We'll get into this rail yard's decline into what you see today, which happened through the 1960s and 70s, and involved everyone's favorite topic, mergers and acquisitions. But for now, here's what you need to know. Portions of this rail yard are still in operation. Today, CSX remains the owner and main operator at Cedar Hill Yard. Amtrak also has a presence here and occupies the portion of the yard west of the river. Some of these tracks are leased to other companies, but all you need to know is that if you go into these zones, you go straight to jail. The abandoned part sits between these two active sets of tracks, and the trail snakes through the remains. There's beauty in the decay here, but there's also beauty in what this once was. So let me show you. Cedar Hill was originally constructed in the 1890s, but to handle increasing traffic as a result of World War I, the yard was greatly expanded between 1917 and 1920. Let's go back to my little map again. Remember, green is active today and red is abandoned. If we overlay the yard's construction map from 1917, we can see exactly what used to be here. All right, nice. So we're walking through the classification yard and motor storage tracks here and would expect to see the remains of the rails, towers, buildings, and what looks like a light repair facility. But over here across the river caught my attention. What was this engine terminal? Well, part of the original yard included two roundhouses, which are gone today, but were a really cool part of the operations here. A roundhouse was basically a giant lazy Susan for steam engines back in the day. Steam engines required more maintenance than later diesel engines would, and usually ran better towing cargo than pushing it in reverse. So, they drive in, get redirected to a bay for light repairs, and then head back out facing the optimal direction. With the proliferation of diesel engines after World War II, roundhouses weren't really needed, and these two were left empty and abandoned in the 1950s. This photo from 1985 shows the remains of one in the upper left, with the larger roundhouse still standing in rough shape. It was later demolished in 1989, but still impressive for how long it stuck around. The roundhouses are gone, but there's one huge piece of history that's still here, the coaling tower. This is where coal would be stored, then dropped into the tender cars underneath to power the steam engines. Again, once diesel became the king of the rails in the 1950s and 60s, the need for these towers declined. This one is still here though, because it doesn't interfere with day-to-day -day operations, and it would be extremely expensive to demolish. So here it sits abandoned as a relic of a different era. Let's get back to our journey though, where we continue to make our way through the overgrown tracks. The first structure we were making our way to was one of the control towers. Pictured here in 1984 in a relatively open space, But this is what we were walking through to get there today. And if you're wondering why these tracks haven't been scrapped, it's illegal to try and cash these in without a certificate from the railroad company. 
And it's not exactly easy to move these things anyway. Most of the paths and tracks were blocked, but we were able to find one open track that had been cleared out. This path eventually led us to the old pedestrian tunnel under the tracks that would take us to the first tower. This is where workers would walk between sections of the yard without crossing active rails. There used to be lights in here, but like most abandoned places, now it's just covered in graffiti. Exiting the tunnel brought us to another roadblock up ahead, this one being a collapsed light tower across the yard. There's a tower here, it's completely overgrown, that just collapsed into this building. And I want to try and get the drone, but there's so many trees around here that I'm going to hit one and crash it, so I'm not even going to try. But this must have made such a noise when it fell, yeah, right? Like, good. look at how, look at how much is in here. It was basically that, that tower in the distance, that's exactly what fell here. The building it fell into used to be the yard office. Only the foundation and basement are left, along with the original generator and chimney. Finally, after a short walk, we made it to the first control tower. Towers usually house an interlocking machine that was controlled by an operator or lever man. The operator would pull various levers, which would align switches and signals through a series of trackside pipes, and slow freight cars as they descended the yard's hump. This photo from 1971 shows the exact tower we were exploring in the upper left. Wow, what a difference 50 years makes, huh? This is one of the control towers, also called a hump tower, placed in the yard. And it's impressive that it's still standing after over a hundred years. Holy crap. Soothie's the brave one today. Soothie's the brave one. If you were hoping to see the controls or the office here, I'm sorry to disappoint you. This tower is gutted, so there's not much to see inside. But if it was an operation, it would look something like this, with an operator communicating with the rest of the yard or controlling switches on the tracks. Look at how this tree grew. It looks just like a piece of plywood. In the distance, obscured by the overgrowth, was another tower that served a clearer purpose, and that's what we visited next. This tower is almost identical to the last one, and it likely had switches inside that resembled these, which were used to control the retarders that were just outside. This photo from 1971 shows the tower we're at now in the distance, and you can see the tracks and retarders to the right of it. Some of these are left now, and their purpose, when in operation, were to reduce the speed of freight cars as they were sorted into trains. They would apply pressure on the wheels so that cars rolling down the yard's hump were slowed to a safe speed. Since the freights would be free rolling at this point, these helped prevent the vehicle from running away by accelerating down the hill. The farther we walked, the more the yard opened up, which made the hike easier. And once we hit Amtrak property, we knew we were getting close to finding that polar bear. Amtrak police, huh? So we're here, we're going south. See how, oh, we just, yeah, we yeah, just yeah. crossed right here. So now we need to go, like we're, we're almost there. Where is it? It's down here, it's where the star is. Oh, okay, cool. 
So we already we're just at the, we're in the same yard. We started up here. Look at how far we already went. We already went down here, so we're like nice. Yeah, like, we're in the yard like now. The third. So the tower we passed earlier that was collapsed. That's how it originally stood, right there. It's pretty huge. But right now there's a bird's nest up there, so no drones for that shot. I can't stress just how massive this yard used to be. So, let me throw some numbers at you. According to a 1928 issue of Railway Age magazine, there were once 14 yards at Cedar Hill with a capacity of 15,000 rail cars. The yard covered 880 acres and was a mile and a half at its widest point. If you're thinking, why was this abandoned? Then I'm really glad because I would love to tell you. The transition to road transport in the 1950s is what started the decline, with 1958 being its last profitable year, ironically thanks to significant business hauling concrete for highway construction. Much of the yard began to fall into decay following the New Haven Railroad's bankruptcy in 1961. This article from the New York Times includes an interview with a former head of the railroad who summed up what was happening saying, I guess the basic trouble is just the evolution in transportation that's going on. The railroad replaced the old stagecoach and river barge lines. Now it's being replaced by the bus and truck. This bankruptcy led to deferred maintenance in the yard and this place started to decline. In 1968, a newer train yard was built in Selkirk, New York, pulling service away from Cedar Hill. In 1969, bankrupt New Haven Railroad was merged into newly formed Penn Central Transportation Company, which inherited the yard and further shut down operations here due to growing expenses and shrinking service. A series of fires in the yard and on major connecting lines further hampered traffic here. And just a year later, Penn Central declared bankruptcy. Damn, uh, is this place cursed? In 1976, Penn Central merged with Conrail, who put in work repairing this rail yard. Oh yeah, try today's equivalent of 13.6 mil on tracks and ties in 1976 alone. Business was decent here, but not like the old days. In 1978, Amtrak joined the western side of the yard, and in the 1980s, the section we're exploring was abandoned as we know it today. In 1999, CSX purchased Conrail's lines and continues to operate here. That's the quick history and brings us to today, hunting for a giant polar bear in what used to be the biggest rail yard on the East Coast. This is just ties strewn everywhere, just all over the place out here. I imagine it'd be pretty creepy here at night too. It's a familiar story. As industry and technology advances, the old ways are left behind, and if they aren't repurposed or demolished, then they're just abandoned. And we get to go find them. Alright, there we go. We found it. This is wild. This is absolutely wild. Look at this thing. Just in the middle of the woods. This structure is what remains of the bad order car shop where light repairs were done. Rail cars are put into bad order status when the car requires any repair to running gear or safety appliances. Things like wheels, trucks, brakes, air hoses, draft gear, couplers, ladders, and platforms. Heavy repairs would have been done at another location in the yard. This photo from 1983 shows the light repair shop already abandoned in, at the time, a field. You can even see the control and light towers we walked by behind it. It was once home to rail equipment, but now it's home to a giant polar bear. Oh my god, look at this. Just in the middle of the woods. There it is. After months of planning, it was unreal to be able to see this polar bear in person.
This is an awesome example of street art repurposing the abandoned into something beautiful. But how did it get here? Artist Michael D'Angelo spent three days building the bear from reclaimed wood and metal falling off the decaying building. At 14 feet tall, the bear was smashed and nailed together, sprayed with a fire extinguisher filled with paint, and spray painted. This wasn't his first project either. Michael is a professional artist who has been commissioned to create well-known pieces of art throughout New England. For this one, he transformed what was once a light repair shop into an art gallery. Now, before you get upset, let me say, this is not vandalism, this is art. Vandalism has no goal other than destruction or defacement of property. This building was already naturally destroyed and for the most part forgotten. So Michael did what any good artist does. He brought it to life. And I love when this happens. Just like the pony henge phenomenon in Massachusetts or the canvas on the Providence National Bank facade in Rhode Island. There's so much potential for places like this. And in this case, I think a polar bear is a step in the right direction. There are still signs of what this space used to be though. It's hard to tell, but there was once a second floor to this building. Here's what remains of that staircase. There's a frozen track in the ceiling that was used to move heavy machinery. And my favorite part, a row of lockers dangling off of what remains of the floor. The boiler room is still here too, with a massive boiler sitting in a pool of water. A hundred years ago, this was a busy section of the yard, so it's amazing to see the decay here. Give it another hundred years and you probably won't even be able to tell this was ever here. So, gotta appreciate these spots while we still can. With our journey at an end, it was time to pack up and make the hike back. So what's going to happen to the Cedar Hill Rail Yard? Like I said, portions are still in operation today, but this abandoned area does have a promising future. It's currently maintained by the North Haven Trail Association, who work to keep this area walkable and open to the public. There's also a nonprofit group called Friends of Cedar Hill Yard on Facebook who are working to preserve the history here in a number of ways. So check out their page to learn more on ways to help. Okay, bye polar bear, we're leaving now. Say bye guys. See ya. interesting abandoned places like this and learn about their history you can check out the rest of my abandoned from above series on my channel right now thank you very much for watching